Okay. Um, let's uh, get started. Any questions about anything um, logistically, technically, or anything before we get started? Um, a couple of announcements. The first announcement is that December 2nd, one thing I, one thing I try to do every year is to arrange a lab, lab field trip, where we actually, a, a class field trip, where we go to a lab and you get to see what uh, stuff really looks like in a molecular biology lab. So this year's field trip is going to be on December 2nd. I scheduled that. That's a, a Thursday, December 2nd, so it's after Thanksgiving. But put that on your calendar. We'll talk about this as the time approaches, okay? It's a microarray analysis lab, so, uh, you know, some of the stuff we were doing now uh, is, in, you know, would be, you know, relevant to the kind of things that they're doing there. Put that on your calendar. That's always kind of a fun thing. Any questions about that? I'll tell, I'll tell you how to behave when we get closer to that. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today um, is I'd like us, we've been starting to talk about clustering algorithms and clustering. And um, I would like, you know, basically like to continue with this. Um, we talked last time about, I guess the place where we had gotten caught up last time was on distance measures, okay? Well, we sort of have this idea that clustering is, there's a bunch of points here, there's a bunch of points here. You sort of want to say this is a group and this is a group. And implicit in that computation is the idea that this point is closer to this point than it is to that point. So we need to get into this idea of what a distance measure is. And um, Euclidean distance measures that people, you know, um, are, you know, probably the most popular distance measure. It's how we measure distance in space. It's basically um, sum up over a set of, we have a d-dimensional point set. For the ith dimension, we find the difference between the value in one point, the ith coordinate of one point and the ith coordinate of the other. Square it. Here we have the absolute value, you notice. The absolute value and square it. Squaring it, of course, the absolute value didn't make too much difference. But there's a reason why I want to highlight that. Basically, what the Euclidean distance was, was the sum of the square root of the sum of the differences of the square, of, of the squares of the differences between each coordinate. Any questions? Yes? So, I've, I'm kind of confused the difference between root mean square deviation and a Euclidean distance. I was on the impression that Euclidean distance, the summation was on the outside of the square. Well, let's think, what is the distance between two points here? If this is a point x at coordinate 1, 1, and this is a coordinate 3, 4, what is the distance between these things? Okay? I believe that that is the square root of 3 minus 1, or 2 squared, plus 4 minus 1, 3 squared. Does everybody agree with that? So that's whatever's inside and outside there is what this is what the distance is. This is the Euclidean distance. Does that solve you? You agree? Yeah, so, so in, in D, in that equation, is that the number of... D is the number of dimensions. Ah, okay, so D is the number of dimensions. So here we had two points in X, Y. If we were dealing with um, three dimensions, Okay, then it would be X, Y, Z, and that, that would be summing up over three things. Okay. Any questions? Okay. This, this I think, may, may, you know, is obvious to many. But what I'd like to talk about that maybe what you're getting at is not so much that there are other distance measures we can think about other than the Euclidean distance. Okay? In fact, there is a general class of distance measures called the LK norms, okay? Let's try this thing, okay? Where what we're going to do is the distance between X and Y is the sum over all dimensions, okay, of the difference between the ith coordinate, you know, the, the ith dimension, okay, between the two points, raised to the K, and then at the end of the whole sum, we take the kth root of it instead of, so, so see what the difference is. Or this is a more general version of Euclidean distance, right? 
instead of squaring the differences between the dimensions, we raise it to the kth power. And instead of taking the square root of this thing, we take the 1 over kth root, right? For k equals 2, this is the Euclidean distance. Does everybody agree with this? Here we take the kth root, okay? For k equals 2, this is the Euclidean distance. The difference, we square the difference in the dimensions, and we take this one half power or the, kth, the, the, the square root of the thing, right? Now note that we can do this for, um, for any value of k, okay? And it gives us something that is a perfectly valid distance function. In fact, it gives us a metric. Yes? What is k exactly? K is the parameter we're going to use to define our distance, okay? We're going to say that what, when we talk about our distance measure, we are going to be talking about the LK distance. Normally, you think of Euclidean. Euclidean is a Greek word for L2 distance. Okay, Euclid was Greek, so Euclidean must be Greek, right? Okay? In the Euclidean distance, you squared the sum of the, di the differences, and you took the square root of it. The square root of it was raising it to the one-half power. Does everybody remember that much? We could do a similar thing for any k. We could consider the L3 distance, where instead of squaring the difference, we cube it. This is why I wanted to take the absolute value of it, right? Because when you, one of the nice things about squaring things is an even num an odd number times an odd number became a even number, right? To take the absolute value first, it's already a positive number. Wait, wait, I mean, it's not, not even odd, positive negative, right? So what is interesting here? My claim is that there is a whole family of distance functions based on this parameter k, right? And what's interesting is they all are distance functions that behave as metrics. That's one way to see what's interesting about it. Remember we talked about what a metric is? A metric behaved nicely as a, you know, as a distance function. We don't have to limit ourselves to Euclidean distance, okay? Any LK metric will do something. What is the criteria to pick one over the other? That's really what I'm doing. Does it make any difference what metric, what value of k we make here? Okay? And this is a little bit of a more subtle point. First, what, let's look at some concrete values of k to see what happens. Okay? What is the L1 distance? Okay? If we think about what happens with the L1 distance, okay, that means that we take it to the, raise it to the first power, which does nothing, and take the first root of it, which does nothing, right? It's just the sum of the, of the differences of the dimensions. Does everybody agree with that? Now, they call that the Manhattan distance. Why do they call it the Manhattan distance? If you go to Manhattan, yeah. It's exactly right, because if you go to Manhattan, Manhattan looks like this, right? And if you want to figure out how many blocks, how far is it to get from this point in Manhattan to this point in Manhattan, okay? You cannot fly like a crow flies, right? You have to walk, okay? The distance is the difference in the x co the, the difference in the x coordinate plus the difference in the y coordinate. Does everybody see that? So the, the, if you have k equals 1, you get the Manhattan distance metric, okay? Does everybody see that? And that's obviously the right distance if you want to talk about the distance in Manhattan. How long will it take to walk from here to there? This would be the right distance metric. Does everybody agree with it? Not the L squared distance, not the, not the L2 distance. What happens if we use the L infinity distance, the, 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 the L infinity distance? This may sound weird. What happens if we take something and raise it, the differences, the sum of differences all to the infinite power, and then knock off the one over infinite power? 
Okay, that may look weird. But what does it matter for? If we want to compare whether two things are... The real question is something like this. If I have these two points, A, B, and C, the value of a distance metric is to tell me whether A is closer to B or closer to C. Does everybody agree with that? What is going to dominate if we take the L infinity distance here? What is going to dominate the distance between two points? Okay? Yeah? Uh, the largest component. The largest component. If you looked at the Manhattan distance, it didn't matter if it was, you know, the distance, if, 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 if the choice was going between 0, 0, and 1, 2, or 0, 0, and 0, 0, 3, right? To the Manhattan distance, those two dis points look the same distance apart. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. But to the L infinity distance, it's going to make a big difference, right? Because what are you doing? You're taking some differences, each of these k differences, the d-dimensional differences, and jacking them up to the infinite power, right? A big power, right? The one that matters is going to be the biggest one. Because the biggest one raised to the infinite power is going to leave the other ones in the dust, right? Not so much. Don't think infinite. Think of the millionth power, right? If I have 1.99999 raised to the billion, or 2 raised to the billion, what's going to happen? 2 raised to the billion is going to be vastly larger than that, right? So what's interesting is, the sum of these differences essentially is the biggest coordinate difference, right? Raise that to the infinite power, take that to the infinite root, it's basically like the size of the biggest coordinate. How many people see that? How many people don't see it and want to see it? Any questions? Okay. So what's interesting is, any questions about that? I don't understand. I want to see it. I want another chance. Any questions? Okay. So what's interesting about it is that which point is closer or not depends upon the metric. Okay. So the shape, if you're going to use a distance metric for clustering, the shape of the clustering you're going to get is going to depend upon this value of k. Now, which is the right value of k for your application? Here is now the question I ask you. Okay? Do you want a big k or a little k yes. in your clustering application? You say yes. Which one? Okay? And why? What would be your criteria for trying to make a decision here? Oh. Depends upon the data. Depends upon what you want to show. Does everybody agree with that? It's a question of whether having, you, you, you really want the distance to depend more upon the biggest dimension, single dimensional difference or the total massive difference. Does everybody see that idea? I'm kind of picturing it like, you know, you have two shapes. If you want to say what is closer, let's say we have this circle here. You might imagine another circle could look like this, right? Or you could have a perfect circle with a nose sticking out of it, right? Which of these is closer to the perfect circle to you, right? If you want the um, blue one to be closer to the red circle, which norm should you use? Which K should you use? Big K or little K? A little k, it's going to sum up the difference here, but not care too much, not care at all or very much how, where it is, the difference is, right? For if you want the second thing to be, um, for the, 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 wait, so if you want the blue to, wait, we want the blue to be closer to the red than the black, okay? So we want blue to be close to red, okay? I would argue 
in this case, the higher norm is going to make it closer, right? If we use a higher norm, this one protrusion, okay, is going to make the distance very large. Does everybody see that? And so it depends upon how you want to treat error, okay? Your errors, you, you know, there's a lot of error and noise on all the measurements. You probably don't, you know, you know, you may not want, you may want to discount that somehow. Okay, a lot of a fuzz around all the distances. That would change what your metric distance is. Does everybody see that? Okay, any questions about the distance metric? So, if we really want to use a distance metric, we get our choice of what k is. If we really want to be careful about it, we might even be able to put some coefficients on here. If we knew certain ones are more important than other, certain dimensions are more important than other dimensions a priori. Okay. We can condition our data, all these kind of things, to make our comparisons better. Yes? That coefficient, would that be before k would be applied to it, or after or it doesn't really matter? I would say, uh, well, okay, in one sense it doesn't matter, because you can always take the kth root of right, that yeah, constant, right. okay? But I would think conceptually it would be outside of it, yeah. would be the logical right. place to put it. Okay? Any questions? Now, there's one other kind of measure you can use to um, record this, uh, this, not the distance between things, but the similarity of things, okay? So remember when we talked about edit distance, we had this idea that distances had to get smaller the more similar they were, scores got bigger the more similar they were, right? And that distances, if they satisfy metrics, we understand them, but scores are sometimes useful things. Another way you might think of measuring the similarity of uh, two points would be to consider the correlation coefficient, okay? So suppose, let's say, we have a, let's say, very high-dimensional data set. Let's say, like, microarrays. Microarrays are good things, right? Okay? So we could have a world where, um, in a microarray set, maybe if we were measuring genes and yeast, there were 6,000 dimensions, roughly 6,000 genes in yeast, right? Um, you conduct, well, it depends, it depends upon what, okay, depending on what experiment you're using, forget about the genes in yeast business, okay? <laughs> Let's say that we have um, a total of D dimensions here, okay? We could have two point sets in D dimensions. If D is large, it might be natural to think of these as sort of time series, okay? And then the question of how similar the time series are, measuring the correlation coefficient, is actually not a bad way to do it, okay? A correlation coefficient, which I think I'll, I'll show the formula a little later. I, well, why not? okay, everyone's probably seen it, right? It's something like, uh, uh, well, it's the sum of the differences from the means, the product of those divided by the standard deviations of these things, okay? But basically what a correlation coefficient is, it's a statistic that varies between 0 and 1 based on how similar the up and down behavior of each one of these things is. Does that make sense? So that if th every time this sequence went up, this sequence went up, okay? That would be a correlation of one. If e yeah. It, on the slide, said between minus one and one. You said zero and one. Okay, it's between minus one and one. What's the meaning of a correlation coefficient? It turns out one means that the signals are perfectly correlated. Every time one goes up, the other one goes up. Right? Okay. Think about it like with my two eyeballs. Okay. Whenever one goes up, the other one goes up. Right? Or if I. Anyway, something like that. Okay? Minus one meant they were anti-correlated. Whenever one went up, the other one went down. Right? Zero means there is no ra relationship between them at all. Okay? A random thing. Right? If every time, you, you, for X, you flip the coin to determine what Y was, the correlation is supposed to be zero. Right? So correlations or coefficients are good things for comparing similarity of time series. 
okay? Preferably long time series, okay? Um, and they are often used in analyzing microarray data. There's some good things about that, but recognize that this is not a distance metric. And so if you use this kind of a measure for clustering, you know, sometimes weird things can happen if you don't know what you're doing, okay? Any questions? Does that make sense? Just to sort of show you, what, where does it say? What was the correlation coefficient? Let's see, oh, let me see if I can get this down. What is the correlation coefficient? Just to double check that, we'll talk about this in a minute. Here is the correlation coefficient, okay, of uh, two time series, okay? We basically compute the mean of one, mean value of one, the mean value of the other, okay? We basically sum up, take for each, over each dimension, the value to which the x is greater than the mean, or less than the mean, x minus the mean, and then y times y minus the mean. Whenever x is bigger than the mean, th and whenever the ith coordinate of x is bigger than the mean, and the ith coordinate of y is bigger than the mean, you get a positive number times a positive number. Whenever both of them are less than the mean, you get a negative number times a negative number, that's a positive number, right? But if one goes up and the other one goes down, you get punished, right? That's a negative value. So to get a high correlation, you need to have them both sort of go up and sink and down and sink. Any questions? And the normalization has to do with the, uh, basically the standard deviation of the two sequences, okay? How much variance there is in the sequences. Any questions? Okay. So with this in mind, we are now, um, uh -oh. we are now um, equipped to measure the distances between pair points. Okay. Any questions about that? Uh, yeah. How about if uh, they go up at the same time but in different scope? Well, if they both go up at same, say, what if they go up in the same time but in different scope? Then. Um, First of all, that's what you mean by different scope, okay? If I have two perfectly correlated signals and I multiply one of them, all the values, by two, one of them is going up by twice as much and down as twice as much as the other one. Those would still be perfectly correlated, right? So how about scope change? Like, uh, so if it's sometimes, you know, this one jacks up all the way and the other one says, oh, I'm only a little bit better than average, the correlation will be positive, but not one. Okay? So that's why, you know, the magnitude of the difference also matters. The sign, the po both being greater than the mean or both negative less than the mean points the sign in the right direction. But the magnitude is dependent upon how much they are, bigger or less than that. Yes? Okay, so you're saying that, that, that if you're using correlation, there's a problem if Let's say you want to measure your correlation of activity. And this is you in the beginning, you're sleeping, and then you wake up and do this kind of thing. And your roommate sleeps later and goes to bed later, right? You're saying the correlation here is not going to be perfect, even though they're really doing the same thing every day. You're right. That's a big issue in time series analysis. But not so much in data analysis of the type we've been talking about, right? If we view each dimension as being a feature, right, how much a particular yeast gene is up, right, it doesn't make sense to talk about, you know, oh, well, you know, um, the fifth yeast gene is still dormant. There's no reason to compare the value of the fifth yeast gene to the value of the tenth yeast gene. Does everybody see that? So, so the issue doesn't quite arise that way. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Okay, so we have a way of measuring the distance between points. Does that suffice to tell us what the distances we want in clustering? And I claim that there's another question you need to think about, which is what do you mean by the distance between clusters? Okay, so when I look at two clusters of points, how close or far away are they? Okay, and this has to do with thinking about what points are involved. Okay? 
So suppose, let's say, we have in all four examples, maybe I'll try to jack up the size of this, this picture here. No, sorry, boom. Here I've got four point sets, four pictures of uh, two groups of points, okay? Um, one blue and one set blue and one set red. And we want to measure how far apart these point sets are. We could take the distance between the point sets as just being the closest point between the two of them. Does everybody see that? Okay. If we do that, then in this case, this is the distance between the two. Note that if we have two clusters that are, well, one cluster is bop, 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 and the other cluster is bop, 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 bop. These clusters would be deemed very close by this measure. Does everybody agree with that? Because the only distance that would measure affect it is here. Does everybody agree? Alternately, we might try to evaluate the distance between two clusters as the, um, what do you call it? The, 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 the average distance where we take every pair of points from one cluster and the other and compute what the distance is to that, right? And then depending upon how many pairs there are, we average that. Does everybody see that? That gives us a different notion of how far apart these two clusters are, right? In this case, by the average link method, I would argue that the average distance between these two clusters would be something like that. Does everybody see that? Okay. Which do we think is a more robust measure? Okay. Of the distance between two clusters? Probably this one. Which do we think is a more expensive one to compute? Probably this one. Does everybody agree with that? Another compromise that we might make for this might be to take these points and compute a centroid representative for it. Okay? Suppose we compute the centroid of this point. Okay? And compute the centroid of this cluster as well. And we report the distance between the two of them as just the distance of the centroids. Does everybody see that? What's good about that? Once you have the centroid, the distance between the clusters is a constant time computation. Does everybody agree with that? What's bad about that? It doesn't take into account the names of that, <coughs> of that, the size of that cluster. Okay, it does take down a couple of things. One is it doesn't take into account the, uh, you said there's the range of that cl cluster. Or the size of well, one thing that's clear is that the centroid for these points would be every bit in exactly the same place if the points were out here. Does everybody agree with that? So that's one issue, the question of whether the centroid is the best measure here. Okay? In one sense, it captures something about all the points. But it doesn't really capture how close or far away they are from the centroid, right? Okay? There's another issue with centroids, though. How do you compute centroids in the case of categorical data? Okay? Suppose, let's say, one of the coordinates is gender, right? And let's say that we have a bunch of points here. And uh, the x coordinate maybe was supposed to correspond, one of the coordinates was going to correspond to gender. It's a female, female, male, female. What is the centroid? Okay, well, how do you compute the centroid in general, right? The centroid you computed by taking each dimension individually, right? And then um, computing the average value of it. That was the centroid. So centroids were not hard to calculate. But what would you do with categorical data? What is the centroid of three men and a woman? A woman, okay? It doesn't make sense in the case of categorical data. Does everybody agree with that? How might we get around that problem? Okay. One possibility say is throw out any categorical data. <laughs> that would be one way to do it. Is there assign, any other way? Assign values. 
Well, one would be assigned values. Another might be, by the way, instead of picking the centroid, to pick the point that would be seemingly most central. Does everybody agree that if you had a distance function, that would tell me the distance between two things, okay? Would compute the different distance between if someone happened to be a man, happened to be a woman, and assign the score to it, right? You could make the representative point be the one that is somehow has the smallest maximum distance to anybody, okay? Or something like that, or minimizes the average distance. So in that case, you're not really interpolating between these values, but picking a representative, okay? Yeah. Okay, so in this picture here, recognize that I, that I am sort of assuming numerical coordinates, right? In order to plot that, right? But on the other end, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to think about clustering people, right? I have records of people, okay? I have somebody who's 673 inches, 130, 80 pounds, male, okay? And, and he has 12 years of schooling. I have uh, somebody else who's 66 inches, 140 ounces, pounds, female, went to grad school, something like this, right? So you could imagine, in this case, I have a bunch of points, okay? I still want to compute representatives of a set, okay? And in this case, you know, so, so, so recognize I'm, if I have non-numerical values, I still might want to compute a clustering of them, right? That's a perfectly natural thing to want to do, okay? Recognize that where I, you know, even if I can compute a distance function, Maybe I can define a distance function that between two of these things gives me a score, right? Then I will know which things are closer. That's what I need a distance function for, right? So there's nothing weird about having a mix of numerical and categorical data, computing a score on it, and computing a, uh, you're know, using that for clustering, right? The important thing is that, that closer things be deemed more similar, okay? The point being that if I, I, I cannot find a centroid naturally for this, okay? Because it involves picking something in between these categorical data, okay? Any questions? Yeah? So if you have non-numerical data, same thing would apply to computing the nearest neighbor? So in finding the nearest neighbor, of stuff with non-categorical data, I need a distance function, right? And it's quite reasonable for me to define a specific distance function based on what I know about those dimensions. Does that kind of make sense? That maybe mentally I'll have some, what would be a, what would be a good categorical data that is not two things, but more than two things? Can anybody think of a dimension? Colors. Colors. Okay, let's say eye color, right? Okay? Again, could be blue, could be brown, could be green, could be hazel, could be black. Okay? Somebody hit you with it, right? Now you may have a notion here that some of these are more similar than others, right? And you could you imagine building a special function just on eye color, based on what you know about eye color, to say that blue and green are more similar than blue and brown, right? Like the Blossom Matrix sort of did something like that, right? That's exactly what it was, right? In the Blossom Matrix, we had what was the similarity between these different hydrophobic, you know, different residues, right? And the ones that were more similar, you gave small numbers. If you have a matrix like that, that gives you a way you can define a cost function or a distance function on categorical data, right? But it doesn't help you finding the centroid. That's really the problem, because you still need to find one of these characters to put in there, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? And one final distance measure, okay, that you might use between clusters is th the farthest neighbor, okay? Given a pair of points, find the farthest one, okay? And that's what the, the farthest example from one cluster to the other might be a representative. Any questions? Okay. 
So why does this matter? Okay, oops, let's shrink it. Boom, boom, boom. Because once we have a, an idea of how clusters relate to each other, how far apart clusters are, we can now define you know, one of the basically most common clustering algorithms, the idea of an agglomerative clustering algorithm. Agglomerative means stick things together. That's what I think, agglomerate, stick things together, right? So in an agglomerative clustering method, what you would do is you would start out with each item being in its own cluster, and then repeatedly merge the two clusters that are closest, right? And every time you merge them, merge them, merge them, until you get tired of merging them, right? And what's left separated are the clusters, okay? So it could very well be that with this point, in, in, in this particular example, here, if I had these points in space, I'd merge the closest pair, closest pair, closest pair, closest pair, closest pair, closest pair. Does everybody see that if I do this kind of thing, at this point, I would probably have the, um, you know, what is the right clustering here, right? And the next merging step, ka -ching, involves something of a much higher cost. Does everybody get that idea? So what is going to be the cost at every point? Well, if we're using a, a simple distance function that we've talked about, the distance between two points is, um, is you know, just defined by like Euclidean distance or whatever LK norm we use, okay? If we're merging clusters that had already been merged, the question is now which one of those clustering distance measures you use, right? Agglomerative clustering in general is merging two non-trivial clusters, one with one or more points with one with one or more points. And which clustering metric you use is sort of to define what the nearest is will radically shape the site type of your clustering. Does everybody get that idea? So if we think about it. If you tried to do a, um, what you call it? a uh, single linkage clustering, where you're always clustering the nearest neighbor, what would happen on, let's say, a long set of points out here? Okay? The first pair to get merged would probably be this, right? It'd be based on, on, on nearness, right? Maybe now we're going to keep merging, merging, merging. We're not going to come up with, at any point, the costs are not really going to dramatically increase. Does everybody agree with that? And we end up with long, skinny clusters. Now, suppose, let's say, we tried doing something where we were merging the uh, average distance. And they were all on a line. I, I, I mean, put them on a line. Sorry. Right? What's going to happen with the merging? Well, this is going to get, uh, once we merge these points together, that's going to be here. We'll merge these points. We'll merge these points. Suddenly, it's going to get very expensive to merge. Let's say this one, we can probably merge in here. The average distance between these three and these two is much higher than the other one was, right? So our natural instinct might be to leave those as separate clusters. Does everybody get that idea? In general, that's probably not the best example of what, what's going on. Because we're really interested in some sense how round our clusters are. Okay? If we have a single linkage method, we're tending to create long, skinny clusters. If we depend upon... Um, that the cost of merging these clusters depends upon everybody in it, we're much less likely to merge these things, right? And so you're going to tend to end up with rounder clusters, okay? Which kind of makes sense. Any questions about that? Okay? So which method you use, which criteria for doing the, the aggregation makes a big difference in the quality of what you're going to... Uh, the, the, the nature of what your clustering is going to look like. 
Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Now, the algorithmic problem of taking points in the plane, okay, and or um, elements and constructing a single linkage clustering of this, this all of our computer scientists should know because this is really nothing more than finding a minimum spanning tree if you stop to think about it, right? Which was, um, which algorithm? Not, not, uh, what was Kruskal's algorithm for minimum spanning tree? Does everyone remember Kruskal's algorithm? You took all the edges, basically all the pairs of points there, and found what the distance was, and you sorted them from least to highest, right? And then what did you do? You basically merged, you kept merging things, okay, unless the two points were already in the same cluster. Does everybody agree with that? And so you ended up coming up with a world where you start out with n points. By the end of the time, you ended up with a tree on these points consisting of n minus 1 edges where each edge was the, was, the, was the result of merging two clusters together, right? Okay. So the good news about single linkage clustering, it's just minimum spanning tree. It's relatively efficient. Okay. The bad news is it's not an incredibly robust method for clustering. Any questions? If I gave you this minimum spanning tree, though, how many clusters would there be in the data set? Here we've got a minimum spanning tree. Okay. How many distinct clusters of points are there here? What? Well, there's one component after we've merged everything. So it could be you automatically say, well, you're going to do this thing, you're going to get the minimum spanning tree and report there's one cluster. Okay? But that would defeat the whole purpose of clustering, right? The goal is to find the small sets. So, so the basic thing that you seemingly want is you might say, merge until the, the edge you're adding is too big, right? Or merge until, if you think you only have about three clusters that you care about, merge until you have only three components left. Does everybody agree with that? The clusters are defined by building the spanning tree and then removing the elements here. Yes? What is the minimum spanning tree? Good question. The minimum spanning tree is a classic computer science algorithm problem, which has to do with... Um, Given a set of points, what's the minimum amount of wire you need to connect all the points? So you could imagine, you know, wire, wire like this. Well, actually, um, wire like this. This is a wire. Does everybody see this wire? Okay. Suppose you wanted to connect a set of points together with wire so that electricity can flow between all of these things. Maybe you're the cable television company, right? All these people want to have cable television in their house, okay? You want to find what's the smallest amount of cable you need to wire up to connect all these houses. The number of the cable or the length of the cable. The length of the cable. That is what we mean by the minimum spanning tree. It's trying to minimize the length. And in this case, this tree actually minimizes the length that it would take to connect all those houses together. Does that make sense? The here, the length is the distance between them, okay? The, and the goal was to connect them with the, using the smallest amount of wire. That's what we mean by minimum spanning trait, okay? And does everybody see that that's really sort of what we're trying to do with this, minim this aggregation thing? Is that we're trying to somehow connect these clusters using the smallest amount of merging, mer merging costs, yeah? Is it an optical illusion or is it the top two of that tree? Okay, if it makes a difference, it's an optical illusion. Okay. That, that doesn't matter to me. The point, point here is there's supposed to be three examples, three okay. close clusters that we would expect to get fully connected before we had the long points. Okay? Any questions about that? So if we think now about how we can do this agglomerative clustering, my claim is that uh, basically the time it takes, okay, is going to be a function of 
how much how we decide how much time we spend searching for the next closest element to, to merge and how much time it takes to um, identify what the costs of that thing are so in the minimum in the single link clustering my claim is that it will take n squared time why is it we're interested in I mean you know let, let, let's let's I mean the basic issue is that there's going to be n rounds of merging, right? If we have all the distances between individual points pre-computed, that's n squared such points compu uh, pairs computed, right? We're going to have to look at each one of these pairs and go through this list once. Okay, let me think what I'm trying to say here. If you look at, okay, my claim is you can do single linkage clustering in n squared time using Prim's algorithm for minimum spanning trees, okay? You still remember Prim's algorithm for minimum spanning trees? It took n squared time, right? The way that I told you about sort of taking the edges and sorting them from highest to lowest will be more expensive, okay? Because this is a dense graph, okay? But the basic principle is that in single link clustering, we're going to try n squared possible distances the cost of evaluating the distance between this cluster and this cluster is simply going to be comparing pairs of points, constant time each, right? If I have to move, if I'm doing complete link clustering, I start with individual points. Then over time, the clusters are getting bigger. In general, I'm going to do n rounds of merging. But the cost of deciding what the distance is between this cluster and this cluster, if this has n over 2 points in it and this has n over 2 points in it, it's going to be n over 2 times n over 2 to figure out the all pairs distance. Does everybody agree with that? So essentially I'm spending quadratic time evaluating the distance between a pair of points in each round. And that's where the n cube thing comes from. Does everybody get that idea? Okay, there might be faster ways to evaluate these things. But bottom line is that complete link clustering is more expensive, probably more robust, produces rounder examples, okay, but is more time consuming than single linkage clustering. Any questions about it? Do people understand how the basic agglomerative clustering works, okay? On a simple level, try all at each state, each of the n rounds, try each of the pairs of clusters, evaluate what the cost is between them, okay, and then merge the best one and repeat. Any questions? Okay, fair enough. So this is what we actually saw. Again, I told you we, we use single linkage clustering on the micro array, on the I mean agglomerative clustering on the microarray example I showed up earlier. That was what this tree was, remember? In the tree case, again, what happened with the algorithm? It merged pairs of genes that were closest, okay? Most similar first, okay? And then, for each cluster, assigned the cost when it was going to be merging them. As you'll notice, the edges here keep getting bigger and bigger the higher they are towards the root. That's because you're constant, mer mer doing the cheapest merges first, then the biggest, more expensive merges, right? And the logical division into clusters here would be delete all the big heavy edges, okay? If we delete this merging, delete this merging, you know, maybe delete this merging and this merging, we're going to end up with clusters like this, like this green funny thing like this big green thing over here that's different from this thing that's different from this thing okay any questions okay so agglomerative clustering is a good thing and commonly used okay any questions another class of clustering algorithm that's sort of very natural to talk about is something called k-means clustering let's come back down here Boom. In k-means clustering, 
if you think about it, um, agglomerative clustering is a bottom-up thing. You start from the individual elements and you try to merge them into a big clustering. In k-means, you decide in advance that there are k um, going to be k clusters I care about. And what you do is you pick k points as representative cluster centers. Then assign each point to the closest of the cluster centers you have. Okay? This gives you a partitioning of all the points into um, what you call clusters. Now that you have which points they are in clustered, you now pick a more accurate center for each cluster and repeat this thing. Let me show you an example that might be easiest. Suppose, let's say, that we have a set of points here and a set of points here. And we'll say, huh, I think there are two clusters here. OK? Why don't I try to find them? OK? I will pick two points at random to be the centers of clusters. Maybe it's this one, and maybe it is this one. OK? And now partition all the points based on which center they're closest to. Does this make sense? What would the partitioning for this be? I believe it would go something like this, right? Does everybody see this? Something like this, OK? All the points on this side would be closer to the red one, and all the points on that side would be closer to the blue one. Does everybody agree with that, right? Well, if we did that, and we now took the centroid of each piece, what would we expect to have happen? Okay? I'm going to guess that the blue centroid is probably now going to be someplace about here. Does everybody agree with that? And the red centroid is probably going to be a little bit more like here. Oops. Does that, do people basically agree with that? And now I assign every point to its nearest neighbor. Which of the points are going to be nearest to red? Well, I think now the dividing line between them is going to be something like that. Does everybody agree? And now the points that would be colored red are these plus this one. And the ones that are colored blue would be these ones. Does everybody agree? And now if I took the, the centroid of each of these, the centroid of the blue is going to get in the right place pretty much, right? And the centroid of the red is going to be a little bit more lopsided than we would like, right? But now if we assign every point to its right centroid, now I think the clusters are going to correspond to about what we think they are. Does everybody agree with that? And so at this point now, all of these points will be assigned to the red center, uh, and all of these will be assigned to the blue center, okay? And after we do this, no other point is going to shift its label, right? And so the process has terminated, okay? So this is the idea of the k-means clustering algorithm, and it's a nice, natural, easy-to-program way to do this. Does everybody get that idea? Okay. Any questions about this one? So the question is, how do you pick your starting points? I know no better way than to start my points at random. Okay? Now, does that mean that, you know, what we would have really liked to do, of course, would have been to start our, our cl cluster with one in this point and one in that point, right? But how did we know that before we started, right? So the basic idea is to pick cluster um, pairs of pick points at random. If let's say we set k is two, you pick a pair of random points. You go through this for as many iterations as you want, ideally till it's sufficiently stable or completely stable. If not, until you're tired of doing it, right? And the hope is that at that point the clusters will be relatively distinct. Any questions about that? Yes. There are a couple of problems here. First problem, the most obvious problem, is what if I don't, how do I know how many clusters there are in advance, right? There is, 
How, how should I guess how many clusters there are? Can anybody think of a way to tell how many clusters I might have? One you say is look at it. But well, suppose this is data in, in 26 dimensions, right? I don't know how many clusters there are. Okay? So the right idea would probably be to do something like run it for different values of k and let this be the average distance. Does everybody get that idea? If I have one cluster, the average distance is going to be very high, right? If I have two clusters, the distance is going to drop fairly precipitously, right? If I had three clusters in this example, what would I do? I would put one here, one here, and one here, probably, right? What's going to happen to the average distance between the points in a cluster? What? It'll get smaller, but not by very much. Does everybody agree with that? It will always get smaller as k increases, right? But we kind of have the uh, in, in instinct that if we looked at the size, the place where it stops clustering, it stops dropping dramatically, probably gives us a good hint about the, um, what the right value of k is. Does that make sense? OK. Any questions about that? So the question is, will I get value? When I run this for different values of k, will I get different values of clusters? So what you're saying here is, wait a second. If I did have my example before of these k points, there is no guarantee that if I run it, in this case, there, there's two well-defined clusters, right? There is no guarantee that what k means finds before it stops finding a local optima is necessarily the right clustering. Okay? Does everybody see that if we got really unlucky, you could imagine a world where if we pick these two starting points, our partitioning would divide the world into the things above and below that line, right? And if we took the centroid of each of these things, right? The centroids of the points are now here. And lo and behold, each one of these things is still closer, the same point assignment. All of these are closer than any of these. Does everybody see that? It's possible that with this out, at this point, we're not going to change, right? The assignment of the points we are the same. The centroids are going to be the same. At this is the point where we give up. What is clear is that if we get unlucky with what we pick as our first starting points, there is a chance we will not come up with the right clustering. Does everybody agree with that? How should we solve this problem? You're saying do some randomization. What I might do my randomization would be in my starting points, right? So I say, oh, you want me to pick two cluster points? OK, pick two cluster points. They're here and here. Oh, is this what happened? Let me pick two other points at random. I get this one and this one. And maybe the same thing will happen. I pick two other points at random. I get one from here and one from here. And suddenly, everything's going to fall apart nicely. Does everybody agree with that? <clears throat> so the logical way to do something like this is to run a certain number of random iterations for each of a certain number of cluster sizes and look and see what happens. The less error I get at each side, the, the, the better my cluster presumably is for a given number of clusters. Okay, And if I try enough random samples, hopefully I'll come close to the, you know, close to the best clustering or a good clustering, or a decent clustering. OK. Well, come to think of it, I have no guarantees. Does everybody see this? I could get very, very unlucky, depending upon what my point set is. With k-means clustering, I might end up with a very, very bad answer. But if I'm not so unlucky, and but you know, if there is a separation and I try enough samples, I'm probably going to find it. Any questions about that?
So your argument is that I, I be, if I start with two points that are very, very far apart from each other, that you think might be a better thing to start with than two points that are really close to each other. And my instinct to that is probably yes, okay? Although I'd probably still take my money on a bunch of random samples rather than you telling me, you know, rather than uh, necessarily the two farthest points. I guess the argument is that the two farthest points probably are going to be in a different cluster. Does everybody see that? But what's the time it takes to find, if I give you n points, what's the time to find the two points that are furthest apart? n squared. Does everybody agree with that? What's the time it takes to do k-means clustering? Okay. Okay. Kn for each iteration. Does everybody agree with that? I have k points. I've got to compare in each round all n points to each of my k cluster centers, right? So it's going to be something like k times n times the number of iterations. Does everybody agree with that till convergence? You can always give up after a certain number of iterations. Does everybody agree with it? You know, I mean, I have to do some experiments with this, but my instinct is this will converge pretty quickly, usually, often, for most things, right? So k times n times i, if you run it for 10 iterations, and you have 10 centers that you're interested in, and you've got a million points that you're clustering, k n i is going to be less than n squared. So just the two farthest points seems like an expensive thing, right? So maybe it may, and, and the other problem is starting with the furthest points. What do you do when you've got 10 things? Let's say that k is 10. You want to try to find, you think there's 10 clusters here. You want to find 10 mutually far apart points, right? And you say, yikes, how would I do it? I would randomly sample it. Try it, and try it again, and try it a small number of times, and hope that you know one of them is going to do a good thing. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes. So it seems to me that if you uh, non-determination points, I think you have to have that number of iterations cannot be determined. Okay. So so what you're telling me, what I'm telling you is this is you're saying it's non-deterministic. Okay. Okay, so let's think about what's going to... You say your, your concern is you are worried about this number of iterations. You are telling me you don't know how long this algorithm is going to take, okay? It might take a long time to cluster. It might not take a long time to cluster. Actually, can anybody give you, if I have n points here, and I have k equals 2, can anybody give me an bound on how many iterations this would run? Let's think about it, okay? How many iterations could this possibly run in the worst case? Okay, if I have n points and k equals 2. You say n squared, and I don't see that. You say n over 2, I don't see that either. All combinations of two points, which is not nc2, okay? It is 2 to the n. Does everybody see this? that somehow there's going to be a red point and a blue point, a red center and a blue center. Does everybody agree with it? And after each iteration, it's got a subset of points, right? And this has a subset of points. And we're never going to repeat the subset of points, because once we repeat the subset of points, we stop. Does everybody agree with that? So the good news is that 2 to the n is going to be an upper bound on the number of iterations. The bad news is 2 to the n is a very big number. The good news is it usually shouldn't take 2 to the n. It should take 10. It should take 5. It should take, and especially, note you have the power to give up at any point that you want, right? At any point in this process, after each iteration, you have a clustering. The only question is whether it's the locally optimal clustering, right? And if you're, you're, you're looking at your watch and you want to go home, you can stop at any iteration, right? 
So the good thing about the k-means clustering is actually that it's quite fast and quite simple. Okay. Okay, so the question is, do you need to store which subsets you've seen before to guarantee that you don't hit that again? The answer, I believe, is no. I believe in each case, I believe that you can go and argue that you're never going to, if you have a set of points, you find the centroid. I think you can argue you're never going to cycle, okay, where you have a, hit a partition. You then take the centroid, you find a different partition. You find a different partition, you take the centroid, and it brings you back to where you started from. That's like an infinite loop. Is that right? I believe it can be argued you will not get into that kind of a cycle. So you don't need to explicitly make, assuming that's true, you don't need to explicitly make these checks. Does everybody agree? So why would we want to use this over uh, agglomerative clustering? So why might you want to use it over agglomerative clustering? Well, first of all, I will still claim it is faster than agglomerative clustering. We agreed that this was something like kn times the number of iterations, where I keep telling you the number of iterations I keep thinking thing is 10. If you make that k times n, agglomerative clustering was either n squared or n cubed. Does everybody agree with that? So the answer is the number of clusters, if you have a big data set, is usually you have a small number of clusters you really care about, right? So this seems to me to be a potentially good thing, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Any questions? Also note that agglomerative clustering, the n squared version of it, the single linkage clustering, is going to pretend to produce long skinny clusters, right? Because merging this cluster with this, if it's close, stick it together, right? Note that uh, k means, if I love to do this on this thing, right? <laughs> k means is going to pick very curvy clusters, right? Because in some sense, the cluster center is a center. It's going to want to pick ball-like clusters, okay? And that seems like what you're usually kind of looking at, okay? Any questions? Okay, so, so k-means is a perfectly respectable thing to do. Okay, any questions? Okay. Any questions about k-means clustering or agglomerative clustering? One is bottoms up, one is tops down. Both of them produce clusters. Any questions? Okay, let's just see if there's anything else here that we want. As we discussed, the um, big issue with certainly k-means also, to a certain extent, the agglomerative clustering is how many clusters do you get at the end, okay? Sometimes you know in advance how many you want, okay? But in general, the argument that I would say is if you have the right number of clusters, adding another cluster should not reduce the average um, distance to, you know, the average distance from the, cent from its, the, the said cluster center, okay? Any questions? And that's sort of your clue that, that you probably have the right amount. In general, you want the fewest clusters, okay, with the property that it will give you a good distance. Okay. Any questions here? There are criteria for measuring when is a clustering good, and it's usually a function of the number of clusters and the average error. Okay? Because, you know, you should take both of them into account. Any questions? Okay, good. What other clustering methods are there that are interesting? Um, an alternative approach, if we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the plans that we've talked about so far, I picture we've got vectors of numerical things in space. That's kind of the natural thing we've been talking about, right? that you have a certain number of dimensions, you can compute the distance between these two things, you do that. There is an alternate, let's say, philosophy for clustering, okay, which gets us into graph theoretic methods, okay, which says that instead of um, thinking that we have a... Uh, what's wrong here? Sorry about this. 
somehow it's not talking to me. Instead of um, treating the elements as uh, distances, okay, Pair, you know, the, the elements as points and computing the distance between them. Say, what if we are given as input a similarity graph? A similarity graph, let me just clear this. I see. A similarity graph, okay, is a graph where we have a vertex for every element, okay, if we want to cluster genes. There might be a vertex between, for ev representing every gene. And we could then imagine doing a, an analysis between every pair to decide whether they are close enough, similar enough, that we want them in the same cluster. Does this make sense? You can kind of talk about saying, well, you know, here are two genes, the distance between them is only, you know, they're, they're correlated point 0.7 in their outcome. That's close enough, in my mind, that they belong in the same cluster. You could now imagine building what I would call a similarity graph where the vertices are your elements, your genes to cluster, your people, okay? There is an edge between any pair of people, okay, with the property that they are similar enough that they belong in the same cluster. And if so, if you build this graph, what you dream to have happen is to have it naturally break down, if you did everything right, if there were two natural clusters, Every pair in here would have an edge between them, right? Because they were close enough to be in the same cluster. Every pair in here would be have, a, have an edge between them. There would be no edge between one of these and one of these. And you would have two, in some sense, complete graphs, a complete graph being what we call a clique, two completely connected graphs of, uh, okay, components, okay, with nothing connecting them. That's what your dream would be with the similarity graph approach, right? You build a similarity graph, and then you look at the connected components in that graph. And the hope is that each connected component, okay, is going to be a distinct cluster. How many people sort of see the basic philosophy here? Any questions about that? What's good or bad about this? What? Calculate using, wait a second, if I have to find a clique in a graph, okay, then that's an NP-complete problem and you're scared about trying that, right? Except in this graph, is it going to be hard to find the clique? If our world was, if our similarity function was perfect, I claim that what we would have are distinct cliques. Does everybody agree with it? If, in fact, there were two underlying components, each of which had a certain number of vertices, all of these would be connected, all of those would be connected. It's not hard to find the largest clique in this graph, is it? Each connected component is a clique, right? So this would reduce to finding connected components. Okay, And that's not hard. That's easy, right? That's depth-first search, breadth-first search, right? For those of you who don't know what I mean by depth first search, breadth first search, we could start at one vertex and say, uh, uh, let's say for this one, start at this vertex, say, who's your neighbor? I'm colored red. My neighbors are also going to be colored red. Their neighbors are colored red. Okay? By just moving through and coloring them, we would figure out what each component is. Okay? So the hardness of finding cliques is not necessarily the problem here. What is the problem? with this kind of an approach. Your concern is a couple of things. Your concern is that I might separate two, one cluster into two clusters. I claim that what I separate or don't separate is a function of how accurate my similarity function is at reflecting the underlying thing. Does that make sense? The big problem here is, if my similarity function was completely correct, that only returned an edge, if the two of them were in the same cluster, then clustering would be easy, right? Then I could look at two of my elements and say, you two belong in the same cluster, okay? 
That's obviously not always true. That's not always easy, right? And so we would expect that in any non-trivial clustering problem, that it would not be the case that uh, we would get perfect similarities. We would expect that there would be spurious similarities, right? If I compared clustering these points and these points, I probably have one extra edge here, right? Which represents, um, what you call it? A, uh, a bridging of these two clusters, right? These two are close enough that I might decide that they belong in the same cluster. Or it might be the case that I have a point out here that is very close enough to these guys, but not close enough so that I wouldn't get that underlying edge. Does everybody agree with that? So the real problem that I have is that, yes, I can look at pairs of elements and say they're similar enough that they probably belong in the same cluster. But in the case that the information is ambiguous, which in any non-trivial problem it should be, okay? I can now figure out which edges that are, not, that are present should I delete, or which edges that are not present should I add in order to make clusters, okay? Any questions about that? And this starts to get us into NP-complete kinds of problems, okay? Any questions about that, okay? Any questions about this kind of a philosophy? The good thing is I can now use the comparis any comparison function between pairs of elements that I want. So categorical data is not a problem, right? <coughs> the bad thing is I have to compensate for this confusing kind of data, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, fair enough. So you, do you have to have for all types of possible things that come up. Well, I claim I've now got to reduce this to a, I've now got to bring in graph algorithms. Now take one of these graphs, <coughs> which hopefully for every pair of clusters, every cluster will have a dense set of connections here. And anything spanning two clusters is going to hopefully have a sparse set of connections. And then try to do some graph algorithmics to try to figure out what are the edges to cut and what are the edges to add to make this a right cluster, okay? This now brings us into the graph algorithm world. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, okay, so you're saying all strongly connected components would be clusters. That's good. But what did strongly connected components mean? Strongly connected components sounds good. They're, you know, macho, strong, well-connected. But what was it? Strongly connected components, as you know about it, are undirected graphs, right? Okay? That's implying that you know the difference between X being connected to Y and Y being connected to X. It's not clear that when you compute a distance, I don't think that what you get from this similarity approach in general is a directed graph, right? So strongly connected components, as you know them, are not what you want, because that's a directed graph concept, right? Any questions? So what might we be able to do here? Let's just think about it. Um, let me show you this one, one OK, I'm going to have to go into this next class. Let me show you one trick that is a good way to find um, sort of strong clusters often, sometimes, in some way. Okay, that's kind of a, fam uh, uh, a cute little graph algorithm problem. Which is, suppose I give you a graph where, um, what you call it? Uh, here I've got a graph on vertices. Let me make this, I'll go to this, and uh, what am I going to do? Let me add another one like this, okay? I, uh, actually, no, let's, okay. Let's say I want to find the biggest section in this graph where every vertex is a high degree vertex. Okay? Let's say I want.